And he served as personal secretary to Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger and then to Pope Benedict XVI until his death in 2022. The 66-year-old German archbishop is without an assignment. After being told by Pope Francis to leave Rome and return home almost immediately after Benedict's death, he's the author of a new book, Who Believes Is Not Alone? My Life Beside Benedict the Sixteenth. I sat down with him recently in New York to discuss the book, Cardinal Ratzinger's repeated attempts at retirement, and that fateful decision by Pope Benedict in 2013 to step down from his role as Supreme Pontiff. Here's my exclusive interview with a man who served two popes and lived with one, Archbishop Georg Gonswing. Archbishop, thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting down with the interview. It's great to see you again. Tell me, uh, in your new book, Who Believes Is Not Alone, uh, you give such penetrating insight into really not only the last years of Pope Benedict, but really your entire life with him, which, which covers, what, more than 20 years. I want to go to something more contemporary, the Synod on Synodality, which we just saw the first phase of. Pope Benedict was around when this was announced. Did he have any insights or concerns about this particular form of the Synod of Bishops? Do you recall? There is a very simple answer. He didn't command that. He read it, but he didn't command it. And I have not asked him. I cannot say why, but I said to, me, to myself, if he is silent about that, he will not be asked. And there was no question, no answer. Finito. Hmm. And, and, and that's how he really, is that how he absorbed, if you will, um, Pope Francis's papacy? He just sort of observed it without getting directly involved or commenting. That's right, that's right. After his resignation, he said, I'm not more Pope, I'm the Papa Emerito. The Pope is Francis. He is the successor of Peter, actually successor, and he has the responsibility to guide the Church and not me more. And all the time, all the ten years, this was his navigation. Mm. It was his clear game and mm. okay. I want to talk later about his prayer life, about the personal side of him we didn't see. But I, I want to take you back. You opened the book in February of 2003. Now you were working then with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger at the Doctrine of Faith. That's where I first met you. What happens during that coffee break in February of 2003 and why? I came to the Doctrine of the Faith in 95 and Colonel Ratzinger was convinced when he was asked Pope John Paul II, I am here more than 20 years. I'm an old man, I'm tired, I will resign. He told, he's, has written and he was there was no answer, not yet, because he came 82. Yes. And uh, there were normally a prefect is uh, nominated for five years, another five years, mm -hmm. another five years, another five years, 20 years. And he said he was convinced John Paul II will, this time, he will, will accept. accept. Okay, that because he had tried to resign multiple times. He told me that in 2003. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. And so he... There are the letters from him to the Pope and from the Pope to him, the answers. And then he said in 2002, I, the first time, I will write another one, another uh, time. And then he must say, okay, I accept. And he was convinced that he will be at most three, four months a prefect. Mm. But his former secretary uh, became an uh, undersecretary uh, of another congregation. Joseph Clemens. Yes. And I need a private secretary 
And we two, she said, me, the Cardinal, and me, uh, he spoken in Italian, Don Giorgio, mm -hmm. we will be, I don't know the precise word in English, in Italian it's provisorio. Provisional. He is a provisional, and me. Uh -huh. And he thought he was going to retire. Yes, and then I retire and he will go back to the old rule. Three months, yeah, 20 years, because there was no answer from Pope John Paul II, month by month, and in April 2005, Pope John Paul died. The conclave, and from the Cardinal Ratzinger, what went out? Benedict XVI. And you got drafted into yes, becoming that was the Pope's secretary. Yeah, that private was secretary. The, 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 the difference was not more living in the, uh, in the Holy Office and working, but in the Apostolic Palace. Mm -hmm. That's all. And that was in February 2003. He was convinced the answer will come. But the answer. Well, you write in the book that this retirement, and I've seen this not only in my interview, throughout his life, retirement, this quest for retirement. He wanted to retire to Bavaria with his brother. They were going to live in a little chalet and write and play music together. He sort of had this vision in his head. But you say in the book, it was a constant theme that was always out of reach. Why do you think he wanted to retire so desperately? Well, I think, and I've seen he was 70, he has seven, had 78 years, 78. Yeah. So 77. And his birthday uh, is April nine, uh, 16. Yeah. And April 19, he was elected Pope, three days after his birthday. Yeah. Now, one thing for him was very, very important to write or to finish a book about Jesus Christ. Like a, a witness about his personal, scientific, uh, life about a priest, about a bishop, and also a cardinal, mm. with all the experiences, the personal experiences. Mm. And therefore he has, okay, that's my, my future, and I have time, and I will finish that book. Mm. And I remember very well then, in April he was elected, and then above two or three months later, because in that time, that three months, he didn't speak about the book. No word. Because he was convinced it's over. He won't be able to do it. It's not, it's not more possible. Mm -hmm. Being a pope, I have to do others. And in, Ju in June, I asked me, can you make a copy of this article? Of course, why not? Mm -hmm. And then, well, for me, it was the first time that that desire to continue mm -hmm. was reborn. Mm -hmm. And that became the Jesus of Nazareth. T tell me about the historic resignation. Okay, here we are, February 2013. It shocked the world. But you knew about this, Archbishop. You had indications of this much earlier. How did you come to know that Pope Benedict intended to resign? And in the book you indicate that you tried to talk him out of it. Yes, How? Right. We have been, it was September 2012. Normally the, the Pope or the Popes have been from the 1st of July or after John Paul II, he liked to go first in the mountain mm -hmm. and then till October, Castle and Dover. Normally, August was a, a free month. Only the general, the general audiences and the Angelus Domini. Right. On uh, Sundays. Okay, Sundays. Mm -hmm. I have seen. In, in, after it was in March and April. He went to Mexico and to Cuba. He went back. Was very tired. Very, very, very tired. And then he slept step by step till July. And in these days, from July to August, 
he was like exhausted. Hmm. Because in these days, or in these days, he finished the third, the small Jesus from Nazareth. And I thought he won all the strength, all what are in reserve, mm -hmm. put down yeah. and put in. He expanded himself yes, writing that yes. book. And then in September, he said to me, normally I was uh, with, by him uh, well, the 11 o'clock with the correspondence, mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon another time, two times a, a day. And he said to me, this evening came earlier. Please come here. Okay. He came. And normally he sit down. He was sitting on the chair on the uh, table, okay. and I was up uh, the lay. And that no, take also you a chair. The first time in huh. eight years. I won't. Okay, and then I have to tell you something. I'm old. I'm. I have no more strength. I reflected. I have reflected. I have prayed. I have struggled with myself. And I have come to the conviction not only that I have to resign from papacy. I love of Jesus and the church. And I said, Holy Father, it's impossible. No, it's impossible. Far away. You can delegate this, this, this. And I've spoken like a, a fighter about five minutes. He was still mm. silent. And then he said to me, excuse me, I have not said something to discuss. It's not, it's not more necessary. I have told you my decision. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, it was, it was that, in that moment I was, I was, I do not know, but it, it, it was heavy. Yeah. And that was the first, and, and, and then he thought, you will be one of the three persons who knows that. And please, you have now be under the pontifical secret. Wow. That was the first time a me, uh, month ago. But did he consider the consequences of that? The, or, or I've read some reports where he assumed his protege, Angelo Scolda, was going to succeed him, or someone like him. Was that the thinking? I, I, I fear that was the thinking. Someone will come and to convince it's not possible, like me. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't hear it. No. Mm. I cannot say why, but he said no. It's 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 it's. I cannot more. And I think, and that. All the years uh, after, when he was a resigned Pope or Pope Emeritus, he never had a doubt that was the right decision. Was it? You've seen all the reportage. It was Vatty leaks. It was no, no, no. Uh, yes, yeah. you, you don't. That has no, 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 no. That is, he said sometimes to me, my, there is no, there is no, there is no reason in all the things that are went wrong, mm -hmm. Vatty leaks or homosexual. Uh, Groups mm. or there, sometimes there was in, in uh, it was not real, mm. and in another way, he said, I can go now because there is no danger of the church. If there is a wolf mm. coming and the the shepherd cannot go, but if there is no wolf, there is no danger, I can, mm. and the Lord will. Preserve and the Lord, the Lord will guide his church with another successor of people, mm. uh, of Peter. Did he regret it? Ma, never. How do you see those ten years? And how? I mean, 
I know he was praying. I know he was writing. I know he was suffering. Tell me about that time. The, the first two months, there was he was exhausted. He was uh, very tired. He has spoken very, very uh, little. Mm. And then, after they come back to Rome, after May, 2nd May, I remember very well, more and more the strength came back. Wow. And there was, uh, he is a very uh, systematic man. No? Yes. Holy Mass, bravery, then the, the breakfast, uh, rest, then bravery, mm -hmm. then correspondence, lecture, music, bravery, and then lunch. Mm -hmm. After lunch, a small, a small uh, walk. We had, had a very... T uh, the gardens? Uh, gardens. No, after, the, after lunch, we have been on our terrace in, uh, in the monastery. Uh -huh. And rest, and then in the afternoon, the first was uh, the bravery, and then we went out to pray the rosary. Back correspondence, and there are, in the first year, at the end of the morning and at, uh, in the late uh, afternoon, uh, there have been guests. Many, many uh, oh, asked. Yeah. Oh. And then uh, dinner, small dinner, and then he retired. And that's many, many years. Of course, he, 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 did not, he did not write. He answered m the correspondence. Uh -huh. But there were a few occasions where he was asked to say something, right. to write something, and also to help something. Hmm. And normally he could not say no. Hmm. And he would not say no. I, I want to talk about Samorum Pontificum, which is one of the hallmarks of Benedict's legacy. Of course, his focus was always on the reform of the reform of the liturgy. That was always his, really his life's work. And whether it was the translations in the Novus Ordo around the world or permitting greater freedom for the old Latin rite. And I'll read from Samorum Pontificum. He said it was always clear, uh, or you write this, it was always clear in Ratzinger's mind that there was only one rite, subsisting in the coexistence yes. of an ordinary and extraordinary form. The one intention of his motto proprio was to repair the gaping wound that had formed over time, be it voluntary or involuntary. Now, w w what were the Pope's thoughts after he saw that motto proprio play out? Was he pleased with the, the way it was received at the time? In that time, Pope Benedict has been very weak, physically. Physically. And normally, he asked me to, to read something he would read and he was there on the paper on the table and I'm here and I have read from the Osservatore Romano the text because the, the only the only text was published in the in that time in the Osservatore Romano. I read and read there was the motu proprio and also the, the the letter of Pope Francis. You're talking about Custodis yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so yeah. the motor. So I was talking about his motor proprio and how it was received, oh. how Benedict was received. Oh, no, but now the, you're talking about oh. when Pope Francis yes. basically clamped down yes, on, yes. The, on the oh. Latin rite okay. and okay. demolished that motor proprio. Although about the, his motor proprio, mm -hmm. Benedict, who no? yeah. was uh, allowed to have a liberal, liberal, liber. You're right. Liber, it was a liberalization. Of the old right. Because what that two intentions. The first, that the liturgy is the way to connect with God. And it's impossible that the liturgy that was the liturgy for five hundred years, many saints and will be forbidden or is not more allowed. And the first step in that direction has made John Paul II. Mm -hmm. yeah? 
Yes, that's the first. With Ecclesia Dei, with where they, they allowed it in certain okay. instances yes, with the permission of the and bishop. In the year after, Cardinal, Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger and also Paul Benedict have seen that's good, but it's too. There are many, not I do not know of many, but there are bishops that did not agree, and that's not good. And therefore, he give more and more and more liberty. Mm -hmm. And let the priests decide whether of they course, wanted to celebrate the old rite or and not. And the second was, liturgy is so important that it cannot be forbidden by means or by motives or by reasons. They're not clear. Mm. And therefore, he said, we will, oh, I will open and that must be, must lead to the peace in the, in the church regarding liturgy. And also mm -hmm. including then uh, Pius XII. Right. Yeah. And it worked. It worked. It brought peace. Yes. It, there was no problem or schism yet. In his retirement, in the book you relate, you sit at the table, you pick up L'Osservatore yes. Romano. Yes. Yeah. You read yes. Pope Francis's motto propria, which basically overrules Benedict and shuts down the Latin rite. What was his reaction? What did he say to you? Pope Benedict had never commanded decisions or motto propria uh, from Pope Francis. It was very intelligent. <laughs> I've written also. It was my impression, Pope Benedict, hearing what I was reading, his heart was very, very trist. And then when I finished, I said, Holy Father, can I ask you a question? Please. I do not understand that motu proprio, because the liberty you have gave with your motu proprio mm -hmm. years ago have brought peace in the liturgy and in the church. And I fear this motu proprio will cause many, many problems. The answer was, I hope God will help us. He, has, he didn't commentate the motu proprio because he wouldn't comment decisions. But, but he did comment when Pope Francis submitted an interview to him that he had given in Italian. Oh, yeah, that's what he said. So, tell us about that. I think it was 2014. And mm -hmm. Pope Francis have given him an interview, ask him, ask, ask him in to give some impressions or, or a comment. Right. And uh, I remember very well because Pope Francis have given that to me to bring to Benedict and Benedict the sure. same way, okay. And he, he did it. But it's the only, only, I think it was the only time Pope Francis has asked Pope Benedict to, to comment or to, to, to give a comment to mm -hmm. that he, he said. And he, he wrote about, he particularly commented on Pope Francis's mentions of homosexuality, abortion, the way it was formulated. He took issue with the formulation. Yep. Pope Francis asked him to comment and following, being obedient. Yeah. He did so. He did, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about your, your, I mean, I see it in your eyes now. It had to be intensely difficult for you because here you are serving not only as prefect of the papal household under Pope Francis, the successor of this man you've served all these years, 
but you're living and continue to serve as the secretary of Pope Benedict. You were caught between these two men every day of your life. That could not have been an easy place to be. You are right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it easy, but I haven't ma never thought, or I have never thought that once this situation will come, the situation was there, there was no manual to, 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 to see what I have to do then, and what I have to do there. I had, I had to do, I, I will not say I was living in two worlds, mm. but there were very different worlds. Yeah, and very different men. And very, of, that, of course, and although a different way, a different manner to, to, to govern the, the church, mm -hmm. to lead the church. I have done it, I've done what I was convinced you have to do with that. I was loyal, I am loyal to the Pope, of, of, of course. No? And the same thing I have I've done regarding Pope Benedict as a Pope Emeritus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was not easy. I had a good, I had and have a good uh, spiritual director. Uh, otherwise, I think it would, it had, would be impossible to survive or to live in a good, also in a good um, situation uh, by heart, a good situation in my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because also, myself, I'm, I'm a human being. Give us a sense of the personalities and the way in which each of these men conducted their papacy. Contrast them, if you will. I, I, I know Pope Benedict was so regimented, you said earlier, systematic in his day. And I saw that every time I was with him. It was, oh, time to go. Have to do this. We have to pray. You know, he, he would cut things off because he was on a schedule. Contrast that with Pope Francis's leadership style and personal style. That's a question I will answer with a phrase from Pope Benedict. He said, the mean, the most important thing a pope has to do is to witness the faith, to be a good pastor, to love Christ and his church. And every, every pope seeing that for very important points has to do that with his personality, mm -hmm. with his past with his biography. biography. Mm -hmm. In 2003, Cardinal Ratzinger told me something about, I asked him, is there a de facto schism in the church? Now this is back in 2003. He said these words and to me, they're almost prophetic. I would say this is a permanent problem of pastoral to help that all people can really uh, share the faith of the church authentically. So I think the first point, is a good catechesis uh, that uh, in the preparation to the faith, in the education to the faith. The other point is also the predication that in homilies we can really year for year learn what is the faith, not only some or always the, the, the same ideas. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very real danger that in the homilies uh, priests and also bishops could repeat essentially their preferred ideas and not mm -hmm. present the completeness of the faith. So, given those words and what we're seeing now, your thoughts on what he said there, and do you think we're in the middle of a de facto schism, where there are people who claim to be Catholic, but really aren't, or don't wish to be, deep down? There's a Latin phrase, de internis non judicat pretor. It means what a, a man really 
things, fields, you cannot see from outside. That is all, all for all priests. And I, the priest is not the preaching to preach his own ideas, but the gospel. Catechesis, homilies, that are the two, and the, the admission, uh, administration of the sacrament, that's the three canals for be or to be a good shepherd. And a priest is not, is, he's not employed by a, by a, by a party, or he is the first witness also of the, that what he's preaching. Mm -hmm. If I do not believe in that what I preach, people, people feel that. Yeah. I, I want to ask you just before we, we conclude, there was a story that went out, I remember this so distinctively, um, as I was on CNN at the time, when Pope Francis moved into the Santa Marta house, which is sort of the hotel, the newest establishment in Vatican City, um, many were saying, look how humble Pope Francis is compared to that Pope Benedict who lived in the apostolic palace, the grandeur of the apostolic palace. Can you write that narrative, if you will, I hated watching them try to play one pope against the other, particularly because I'd been in that room. Tell us how Pope Benedict lived and what living in the Apostolic Palace really looked like from someone who lived there. The Apostolic Palace is a renational building of the 15th century. Yeah. Living there in the third floor yeah. is it's not a, it's not a, a luxury yeah. it's not uh, there are it's it's true that there are great rooms yes beautiful hallways the of most course. spectacular hallways yes. but the rooms oh, no <laughs> they're like this no it's uh, <laughs> yeah. nothing nothing Very special spirit. yeah but it seems that not living more in that palace or in that place but in another place Building, build up in uh, 1996, Six. 97, mm -hmm. all the, with the, with the technical and the, all the, the, the nice the things, of course. <laughs> you cannot compare it that. And that it's not, it's not, who knows Pope Benedict or Paul VI or John Paul II? There was nothing special in that palace. Nothing special. Not in their apartment. No. I mean, they were little no. single bed. I mean, the bed, John, I remember seeing John yes. Paul's little single bed. Yeah, the, the same for Benedict. Oh, he kept the same yeah, setup. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's no. a, I mean, it, this was not luxurious at all. No. And it's kind of drafty in the winter. Oh. I mean, he, I remember seeing him with a, uh, yes. he looked like an Indian chief with a, you know, yes. blanket over his shoulder. But the narrative was born and therefore it's once about two months after the election of Pope, or three months, there was an audience with a, a school from school from, from, from Napoli, from Naples, and uh, one girl has asked Pope, Pope Francis, why did you change your home? Why not the Apostolic Palace? Why Santa Marta? And then he said, my dear, there is more a uh, psychological reason. And the first time he said, it's not because it's very, it, it's luxury or it's for the rich and no. Mm -hmm. But it was too late to change the narrative. Mm. Mm. Interesting. But it's, for me, that's, the Pope, is a man. The Pope has a, his personality. Mm -hmm. And then the papacy. And the papacy has also his, the form, or his forms, developed about many centuries. Yeah. And became a Pope means also to get down under that papacy. There, are, there is no private life more. I think this for Benedict, the most well, the, the, what was very heavy was to, to have no more private life. Mm. 
and that's that's a prize. A prize. That's a prize. Yes. Being a one of the yeah. uh, prize, being a pope. Hmm. What do you want people to take away from who believes is not alone? My only intention was to distract, if it's possible, the, narr the, the false narratives about Josef Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, and Pope Benedict. One. Second, to correct many, many, many imagines of a man who was more shy, more humble, that a prepotent or a, a political man, mm -hmm. but he was a very intelligent man. The intelligence and also the faith, the deepness of his face, the clearness of his faith, and also the faith is really one of the most important things to have joy in the life, mm -hmm. to connect with God, and to open the life for the eternal life. Mm -hmm. That was you, only. What did you learn from him in those last days, in that last period? I mean, when you're with someone, particularly someone with a deep faith life, when you see them at the end of their life, going through the struggles that we all will go through, yeah. What did you learn from him? What did you take from that? Moment? Two things. The first thing, he was, what he teached, he lived. And he lived that also in the last month and weeks and days, getting more and more down. Weak. Weak. The second, there is no reason to not remain a faithful Catholic because it's the direct way to the heaven. What a great way to end the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Who Believes is Not Alone, My Life Beside Benedict XVI by Archbishop Georg Ganswein is available now at bookstores everywhere and online, including the EWTN catalog.